Hi, I'm Devon. Welcome to West B. One of our favorite services is Christmas Eve. Join us for a family-friendly service at our 43rd Street campus at 4 p.m. or 6 p.m. or at Southside at 5 p.m. Merry Christmas! Well, almost. We will, I repeat, We'll be having worship on Christmas Day at 10 a.m. at our 43rd Street campus and 11 a.m. at Southside. Groups will not meet on that day. Kids, brush your teeth, but feel free to come in your PJs. Adults, you can come in your PJs as well. I know I will. Merry Christmas from the church staff. Our office hours will be modified through the end of the year. Check out the worship guide for specifics. Also note that we will have one, just one worship service on New Year's Day at 10 a.m. at the 43rd Street Campus and 11 a.m. at Southside. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. Most people name a child with some intent. There's a a purpose to the name. Uh, Like with our oldest, Maggie. It's just Maggie. It's not Margaret. It's just Maggie. And we just like the way that it sounded. That's what Aaron and I decided. And we had lots of discussions. Our firstborn child, we had lots of discussions about names. And we just landed on Maggie because we liked the way that it sounded. Uh, I think of my uh, secondborn, Bryn, B-R-E-N. Um, she is named after my mother-in-law, Brenda. And we just took the D and the A off. We call her Bren. Joel is a family name in, in, in my family. Uh, and then Dominic, our, our adopted son, his middle name is Alan. So we, 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 we named him Alan, Dominic Allen, um, because of Aaron's dad, whose middle name is Alan, and because uh, of the person who helped us adopt Dominic, his name is Alan. Jesus names the greatest man in history. Now, imagine this. Imagine this. Jesus, the Savior of the world, saying, this man is the greatest man to ever live. That's actually in the Bible. We know who that is. We find it in Luke chapter 7, verse 28. I tell you, of all who have ever lived, no one is greater than John. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. Now, Jesus' point there, you know, yeah, he's saying John's the best. Uh, and we're going to get to who John is here in a second. But John's the best. But even though he's the best, the least in the kingdom is even better than he. And he's making a point there about the importance of the kingdom of God. He's saying even the greatest on the outside of the kingdom of God, well, it doesn't matter. You want to be inside the kingdom of God. Now, John the Baptist, that's, that's his name. That's who Jesus has named here, John the Baptist. Who was he, and why would Jesus say this, and what does this have to do with Christmas? All right, let's talk about that today. We're going to be in Mark 1, Luke 1, and John 1. So we're going to cover the first chapter of three of the four Gospels. Mark's Gospel records John the Baptist as the one who would, uh, as the one prophesied by Isaiah. Um, And John the Baptist is the one who would prepare the way for Jesus. So let's go read this text, Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read you the first three verses here. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. So John the Baptist was not one of the 12 disciples, but he was a a, disciple. a prophet who had his own following, his own disciples, and he prepared the way for Jesus uh, as they were waiting on the Messiah. And then John would actually hand over his disciples to Jesus, which is very unusual for the time. But John's role was, hey, I was preparing for Christ. Now that he's here, you should follow him. Now, many of you may know who John the Baptist is. Some of you may not. Let's all get a refresher here for, uh, for his role in the New Testament. This is the guy that wore camel hair. Now, understand, this is not a fashion statement at the time. It's not like this was the thing to have, the camel hair jacket. No, no, no. This this was an unusual thing to wear. He was poor. He lived in the woods. He was simple. Frankly, he was weird. Now, his dad was a priest, so you could call 
John a PK, which my priest kid or preacher's kid that might explain his oddness some, but he was even more strange than the strangest of all the PKs out there. He, he ate locusts and wild honey, which is basically another way of saying he ate bugs and sugar. That's how he, that's how he lived. That's his, that's his protein. That's his, that's his sugar. He's not mainstream at all. And he's the cousin of Jesus. They both grew up together. So Jesus would have known who he was, and John would have known who Jesus was. Now, John was the first prophet after 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what does he preach? He preaches repentance, that you should turn away from your sins and turn towards God. Now, let's continue with this text in Mark chapter 1 of who John the Baptist is. So those first three verses point out how John prepared the way, and verse 4 names John. It introduces him. So let's read this. Let's look at verses 4 through 8 in Mark 1. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that, he had, that, they, had been, that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist was a prophet with a specific message and a specific call to action. The message was that the Messiah is coming. We should all get ready. And how? How should we get ready? Here's the action. Uh, repent from your sins. Turn from them and be baptized, which is a sign of forgiveness. Now, we say Baptist, John the Baptist, because he baptized people, as we see here, which is uh, in the Greek, baptizo, which means immerse. So people would come out to the river. He would put them under the water, bring them back up in a very similar way that we do today. And people would go into the wilderness and they would be baptized to demonstrate that they were serious about dealing with their sin. Now today, we baptize those who are making, making a profession for Jesus. So this was kind of a, a, you know, an identifying mark of following Christ. And ultimately, Jesus himself would be baptized by John and it would be a sign of what believers should do as they follow Christ. So you repent of your sins, you believe in Jesus, and then the next step of obedience is baptism to show that you have made that decision and to tell people that you have made that decision. Now, how John the Baptist gets his name, that's a fascinating story. Back to this idea of having, you know, some sort of intention with naming your children and and, and Jesus naming John as you know, the greatest ever. And okay, what does this have to do with Christmas? All right, let's let's dig into this. So Elizabeth is Mary's older cousin. She's married. Elizabeth is married to Zechariah, and they can't have children. It, you know, it's something they struggled with childlessness. Um, but through a miracle, she is pregnant at the same time as Mary. And Elizabeth, older, is, is pregnant with John the Baptist as Mary, her younger cousin, is pregnant with Jesus. So let's go to this story and let's look at Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 57. And I'm going to read all the way to the end of chapter 1. And part of what I'm about to read uh, includes uh, Zechariah's prophecy and praise. So particularly as I get to verse 68, um, let's pay attention to, to what the text says. So let me read this to you. Uh, we'll begin in Luke 1, verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What? they exclaimed. There is no one in all your family by that name. So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again and began praising God. All fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread through the Judean hills. 
Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, What will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestors Uh, to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear and holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. John grew up and became strong in spirit. He lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. So just like Jesus, whose parents brought him to go through this dedication process on the eighth day following birth, um, obviously Zechariah and Elizabeth do the same thing with John. The custom was to reveal the name of the child at the circumcision ceremony where the child is dedicated and uh, a sacrifice is made. It was routine. It was a routine thing. Every every God-fearing Jew would have done this. They would have brought the child on the eighth day to go through this ceremony and then announce the name to everyone around. Routine, but for that family, it was exciting. Now, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they're part of a a pious family. Uh, Everyone is present at this religious ritual. Everyone's excited. Everyone's expecting the baby to be named after his father, Zechariah. So you can only imagine, oh, what's his name? And, you know, his name's got to be Zechariah. And Elizabeth's like, no, no, his name's John. And the family's like, John? But that's, it's not a family name. You know, wh- wh- why why John? And so I, I love this. They're like, you know, Elizabeth, no way. We're going to go to Zechariah. By the way, Zechariah is deaf and mute. We'll get to that here in a second. And why is he deaf and mute? Um, and they're like, Zechariah, they're, everyone's gesturing. Like, can you just imagine them before Zechariah? Like, what is his name? And Zechariah's like, okay, bring me a writing tablet. And he confirms the name. No, his name is John. And you can just feel the, you know, kind of feel the moment with these people. And it, they're just like, really? What is going on? So, all right, let's go back a little bit. Uh, look at Luke 1, verse 13. And back in Luke 1, verse 13, there's an angel that visits da- Zechariah. And and, and the angel says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Okay, so very clearly, there's an angel that has visited Zechariah. They've they've said, okay, the angel, just like the angel with Mary uh, and Joseph, name him Jesus, name name him John. So they named him John. Um, And then, you know, there's this this miracle that happens. Now, the the reason that Zechariah was uh, not able to, to speak or to hear is because he doubted. Um, He doubted, you know, being able to have a child. Um, And then we get another miracle that occurs where, you know, after Zechariah is obedient and says, okay, we're going to name him John, God allows him to to speak. And and what does he do first? It says here that he praises God. So let's let's understand the progression here. Zechariah had been mute since the angel visited because he had doubts about the pregnancy. Um, he and Elizabeth were, were elderly, so you can kind of understand where he's coming from. But God has now ended the judgment. He's, he's lifted the judgment. The, the silence is no longer there. And because of that, Zechariah praises God. Now, let's make this connection. Zechariah's silence is, is no more, and he's praising God. Think about what John the Baptist does. He's the one who speaks after 400 years of silence. He's the first prophet since Malachi. And what is he saying? He's saying the Messiah is here. Jesus is here. It's time to lift our praises. Advent builds an expectation of excitement and culminates in a chorus of praise. Now, what is Advent? We've talked about this the last few weeks, but what is Advent? The word means coming or arrival. 
And we, we know Jesus came as the Christ child, but we also expect him to come again. So we're at Christmas, we celebrate the first advent, the first coming of Christ, God in the flesh, the incarnation, that first, that, that first time that Christ came to earth. But there is another time. There's a second coming, a second advent that hasn't occurred yet. We're waiting for that. So, you know, as we wait, you know, during the season for of Advent and we lead up to the time of Christ's birth, it should make us long for that second coming when Christ will return to judge the living and the dead. Advent at Christmas, the calendar, is typically the, well, it's the four days prior to Christmas Day. And it's this season of celebration and expectation. It's a season of excitement that builds for the birth of Christ. So when you praise God, you're proclaiming his worth. You know, and, and we've, we've talked about this, about ascribing worth to God, praising God. We bless the Lord in his name. We give glory to God in worship. We offer thanksgiving. We, we, we might even say hallelujah. It's a great word to say because it literally means praise the Lord in Hebrew. So Zechariah does this. He offers the Benedictus. So back to Luke 1. You've got Mary's praise, which is often called the Magnificat. And it's, it's Latin. It's um, that, that first word in the Latin is magnify. My soul magnifies. So magnificat is just the Latin. That's Mary's song of praise. And then we have Zechariah's prophecy, which is also a form of praise in the Benedictus. And it's, again, that, that first Latin word, praise the Lord, Benedictus, meaning, you know, blessed be the Lord's name. Um, it's often translated praise because blessing God is a form of of praise. So, what, just to refresh, uh, magnificat, magnify, benedictus, blessed. If you look at verse 68, where all of this begins with Zacharias praising God through, the pro through his prophecy, um, it, Zacharias' prophecy was one of praise, and John would then prepare the way for Jesus, who would then offer salvation to all, which we see uh, in verses 76 and 77. Now, what we learn in all of this is that preparation uh, leading, we see preparation leading to praise because of salvation. John proclaims salvation. Jesus takes people to salvation. It's the same process. That this, is, this is all about sharing the gospel. We share, Jesus saves. Proclaim salvation, then Jesus, Jesus is the one that does it. And then the Holy Spirit's working all along, and then we respond. So God does the work. We are the messengers. And this is what Christmas should inspire us to do, to share the good news. Okay, we've looked at Mark 1. We've looked at Luke 1. Let's go to John 1 now, and let's learn a little bit more about John the Baptist. So visit with me to uh, John chapter 1, verse 19. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well, then who are you? They asked. Are you Elijah? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? No. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who, who have sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who had sent him asked, if you aren't the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water, but right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be a slave and untie the straps of his sandal. This encounter took place in Bethany an area east of the Jordan River, was John, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I, for he has existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. So Advent, 
is all about exalting Jesus' name over everything else. You know, John uses his voice to elevate the, the message of Jesus. We, we see that here in this text. He's, he's proclaiming Christ above anything else. And, you know, frankly, this time of year, really any time of year, but perhaps especially this time of year, it's December, there's a lot of noise out there. And frankly, today, you can be as loud as you want to be. I mean, you know, social media, you, you can, you know, you, you can be as loud as you want. And frankly, you can also be as distracted as you want with the voices of others. What John is saying is let's mute our voice like his dad, Zachariah. Let's mute our voice and focus on Christ. The silence was there to keep the focus. The silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 400 years, the silence of Zechariah, and what John is saying now, let's decrease so that he can increase. Jesus takes away the sin of a, of a superior self-image where you have too high a view of yourself. But frankly, Jesus also takes away the sin of an inferior self-image where you have too low a view of yourself. And, and John the Baptist strikes this balance here. He says in verse 27, I'm not worthy to untie his sandal. It's something only slaves would do. And he, by the way, he's not saying I despise myself. Not, not at all. In fact, you know, John's calling people to repent from their sins and, and turn from those sins. And with your sin, you have, you have three choices. You can embrace your sin, which is not advised. Um, you can hate yourself, which the Bible says you shouldn't hate yourself. Uh, or you can hate your sin, which is what we should do. So don't embrace your sin. That takes you to a very dark place. Don't hate yourself. That takes you to a dark place. Hate your sin and choose Jesus. That brings you into the light. You are free from the trap of your own voice. You're not enslaved to what other people think about you. You're not enslaved to what you think about yourself. You are bound only by what God says about you. It's not about what you think about yourself. It's not about what others think about you. It's what God says about you. And John the Baptist gets this. He doesn't have a superiority complex. He doesn't have an inferiority complex. He has a Jesus complex. He's focused on Christ. So in this passage, um, the Pharisees come out to, to take him, the priests and Levites come out to visit him to, to figure out what's, what's going on. They're, they're, they're watching anyone who might threaten their power. And they begin like this, this trial-like Q&A here, you know, who are you? And, and John's like, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Elijah, you know. And by the way, some thought that Elijah may return since he, had, he was carried to heaven in a chariot uh, in the Old Testament. So there were a handful of people at the time who thought he might return. And he's not the prophet. You know, they, 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 they ask him that. And he's not the prophet of, 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 of whom Moses spoke in Deuteronomy 18. By the way, John could have used the op this opportunity for his own gain. He, he could have, you know, enhanced his own glory by claiming something, by claiming something he's not. He could have made some claim that, uh, you know, allowed for crowds to draw around him, but he didn't do that. He used his voice to point to Christ. Who do you think you are, they ask him. And, and John refers to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. I'm the one preparing the way. John created waves by baptizing repentant people. People were coming to him to confess their sins, the, the guy with bugs in his teeth is actually getting everyone's attention. And what's he doing? He's pointing everyone to Jesus. He's using his voice as a mouthpiece for Christ. So, these people, they're coming into the wilderness. This is where, you think about the wilderness, the theme of wilderness in the Bible. Um, this is where God gathered his people to deliver them from slavery. The wilderness is where God would equip his people for service. You can read the stories of Moses and Jesus and Paul, and, and this is where God equipped them. So by coming out into the wilderness to, to John to be baptized, the people here, the crowds, they're admitting that they were wandering from God and they wanted to be drawn back towards God. And the fact that the Jewish people were doing this, it's highly unusual. I mean, people coming from Jerusalem into the wilderness. and 
By the way, baptism was typical only for Gentile converts. So the fact that these are people are already claiming, you know, to be the nation of Israel, you, know, you would only be baptized if you were converting into Judaism from being a Gentile. This is all very strange. The fact that the Jews were doing this from the religious capital signified that they truly were waiting on a Savior. They realized that John was proclaiming truth, and they were waiting for Jesus, and then Jesus enters the picture in verse 29. He is the Lamb of God. Why a lamb? Why not a bull or a goat like other sacrifices? And the reason is very simple. A lamb does not fight back. Jesus, as he was offered as a sacrifice, as he was brutalized on the cross, did not fight back. He was a willing sacrifice. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. That's Isaiah 53. Because the lamb was silent for us, we now need to be loud for Jesus. You go all the way into the last book of the Bible, Revelation. It reveals that worship is in heaven is loud. You know, think of Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, and they, they sang in a mighty chorus. This is a loud song. Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Back to John here, verse 32 through 33. John knew Jesus because they grew up together, but he didn't know him as the Messiah until it was revealed to him. And we see this here in this text, and I find that fascinating. It's like, yeah, I grew up with this guy. He's my cousin. Ah, but now I see it. He is the Messiah. And that's what John testifies to, that Jesus is the Son of God. Don't let the world's noise drown out the silent lamb. Let's be loud at Christmas by making a decision to follow Christ. Let's be loud at Christmas by inviting someone to church. Let's be loud by uh, telling others about who Jesus is. Let's be loud by sharing within our own families the importance of Christ. Let's be loud by making disciples. Let's be loud by being faithful to the church, the bride of Christ. You know, what did Jesus mean when he called John the Baptist the greatest person ever? Now, back to the beginning, where, where, where we started with all of this, that Jesus names John as the greatest person ever. Well, what did Jesus mean by that? John was great because he communicated the greatness of Jesus. So this Advent, Let's not focus so much on achieving or obtaining something. Instead, let's work on advancing the good news of Jesus. That's what makes this season a Merry Christmas. It's Christ himself.